In the late 70s, Dr. David Jenkins of the University of Toronto realized that knowing the total amount of carbs in foods was not enough to predict the effects of these sugars on blood glucose fluctuations. Knowing the type of carbs contained in a food, simple sugars or complex carbohydrates, provided some clues but was far from sufficient to make a correct prediction. There are some foods that are rich in complex starches, such as white bread, that raise blood glucose quickly and abruptly, whereas some fruits rich in simple sugars, such as blueberries, barely raise blood glucose at all. In 1981, Jenkins and co-workers published a landmark article in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition in which they proposed a new indicator that was able to measure the speed at which a sugars containing a specific food would raise blood glucose and they call this indicator glycemic index. Propelled by numerous findings about the detrimental effects of repeated and elevated blood glucose and insulin peaks and their risk for fat accumulation, obesity, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease, the concept of glycemic index soon became very popular. The higher the glycemic index of a food, the faster its carbs entered the bloodstream and raised blood glucose, causing the pancreas to release insulin. You may wonder how this index is calculated. In a few words, here's how. You take a solution of 50 grams of glucose in water and you give it to a group of individuals. Then for the next two hours, you draw a drop of blood by finger punctured at regular intervals and you measure blood glucose concentrations. In this example, you see that blood glucose peaks between 30 minutes and one hour, and after two hours, it's almost back to baseline. If you measure the area below this curve, you know it's proportional to the amount of glucose that was in the bloodstream during these two hours. Then you take the same subjects and you have them eat a test food, say a bowl of lentils, in such an amount that the quantity of carbs they contain is still 50 grams. Let me stress this again, you are not giving them 50 grams of lentils, but a serving of lentils that provides 50 grams of carbs. Now you do the same measurement, and in this example you see that the peak is about at the same time, but it's much lower, and it doesn't decline as fast. Of course, different people will respond in different ways, but this doesn't matter because you can use the first measurement to standardize the result. So you calculate the area under the curve for your lentils, and you divide it by the area you obtain for the solution of glucose, times 100 to get rid of the decimals, and there you have your glycemic index of lentils. If you have worked well, you will get very similar numbers in all your different subjects. To complicate things, some labs have chosen not to use glucose in water as a standard, but white bread. This has advantages and disadvantages, whose discussion goes beyond the scope of our course. Just keep in mind that you cannot compare GI numbers from different tables if they are calculated using different standards. The numbers I will show you here are all calculated using glucose as a standard. The concept of glycemic index is often misunderstood, so let me clarify a very important point. The glycemic index is a measure of the speed at which the carbs in a food raise blood glucose levels. It is not a measure of the extent of this effect, because the glycemic index is independent of the amounts of carb contained in a food. Think of a man target shooting with a gun. The glycemic index would tell us how fast he shoots his bullets, but it does not tell us how many bullets he has to shoot. If he only has a few bullets, he can shoot them as fast as he wants, but he'll still not be very deadly. So the glycemic index only makes sense if we consider it together with another piece of information, which is the amount of carbs contained in that food. For example, carrots have a relatively high glycemic index, but they also have very little sugar. This means their sugar enters the bloodstream fast, but because it's a very small amount, the overall effect of carrots on blood glucose and insulin release is minimal. Conversely, the glycemic index of potatoes is lower than that of carrots, but while an average carrot has about 4 grams of carbs, an average potato has about 25 grams. So even if these carbs are absorbed more slowly, they still have a significant effect on blood glucose and insulin, because they are a lot. To take into account both the glycemic index and the total amount of carbs, a group of researchers from Harvard University proposed in 1997 the concept of glycemic load. It is very simple. It's just the glycemic index of a food 
times the amount of digestible carbs contained in a standard serving of that food, divided by 100, just to get rid of some zeros. This way, you have an index that considers both factors. If a food has a low GI, but a lot of sugars, its glycemic load will still be high. Conversely, if it has a high glycemic index, but very few sugars, its glycemic load will still be relatively low. Let's go back to our previous example, and let's consider a glycemic index of 72 for carrots and of 63 for boiled potatoes. The glycemic load of our carrot would be 72 times 4 grams of carbs divided by 103. The glycemic load of our potato would be 63 times 25 grams of carbs divided by 116. So the glycemic load of our potato is more than fivefold the glycemic load of our carrot even though its glycemic index is lower. Watermelon also has a high glycemic index of 72, but a slice of 120 grams only has 6 grams of sugar, so its glycemic load is 4. A banana of the same weight has a much lower glycemic index, 52, but it has 20 grams of carbs, so its glycemic load is 11, almost 3 times that of watermelon. Of course, the glycemic load has one big disadvantage compared to the glycemic index. The glycemic index is always the same, independent of the amount of food. The glycemic load is always based on a specific amount of food. If I eat three slices of watermelon, the glycemic load would be three times higher, while the glycemic index would still be 72. Take this Coke. Its glycemic index is 58. A small 100 milliliters glass a 330 ml can or a large 600 ml fast food cup all have a glycemic index of 58, but the small glass has 11 grams of sugar with a glycemic load of 6.4. The can has 37 grams of sugar, glycemic load 21.5, and the large cup 67 grams of sugar and a glycemic load of 38.9. And by the way, 266 calories. The composition of a food is, of course, the first determinant of its glycemic index. In particular, two key factors are the type of carbs and the presence of other nutrients. As far as simple sugars are concerned, glucose raises the glycemic index much more than fructose. Sucrose is in between since it mixes the two. As for complex carbs, the more branched starch is, the lower the glycemic index because it will take longer to break it down. As for other nutrients, the presence of fiber, proteins, and lipids slows down gastric emptying and intestinal absorption of glucose, thus lowering the glycemic index of a food. It is easy to understand why whole grains and their derivative products have lower glycemic indexes than their refined counterparts. But many other factors affect the glycemic index of a food, including preparation, processing, and cooking. Let's consider our potato again. If we snack on it raw, its glycemic index will be close to zero because the starch of a raw potato is almost entirely undigestible, so it will travel intact through our small intestine without absorption. If we boil that potato, its glycemic index will quickly raise to about 60 because starch gelatinizes with heat and becomes easily digestible. If, however, we eat that same potato with its skin, its fiber will slow down glucose digestion and absorption, and as a result, its GI will be lower. Conversely, if we turn that potato into a mashed potato, its GI will further raise because starch becomes even more accessible to our digestive enzymes, which will convert it to glucose even faster. Finally, if we don't eat our potato at all and just leave it there at room temp, within a few hours, its starch will start retrogradation becoming less and less digestible and its GI will progressively decrease, together with the desirability of our potato, which will become less and less soft and buttery. The degree of cooking always matters. If raw pasta has a glycemic index close to zero, al dente pasta, the way we Italians like it, still somewhat firm, has a GI of about 50, because part of its starch is still harder to digest. Conversely, overcooked pasta, to the point it becomes soft, that you somehow appear to like, has a GI about 10 points higher because its starch turns to glucose much faster. Some technological processes also fragment starch, raising GI, such as extrusion to make potato chips or cornflakes, or pressure steaming to make puffed rice.
as far as fruit is concerned, the degree of ripeness influences the GI. As the fruit ripens, its acids are converted to sugars, the texture becomes softer, and the GI tends to increase. An overripe banana will have a higher glycemic index than one that's still green. And then, of course, peeling fruits and veggies always raises the GI because you remove a lot of fiber. Whenever we cut, blend, puree, or in any way turn a food into smaller pieces, the work of digestive enzymes is easier and glucose absorption is faster, so the GI increases. If you turn your bowl of lentils into a lentil puree, its GI will be higher. If you juice a carrot, carrot juice will have a much higher GI than the whole carrot, and so on. So far we have talked about individual foods, but it is important to remember that most of the time we combine different foods in a meal. When we do that, these foods mix in our stomach and get digested and absorbed together. So what really matters in the end is not the glycemic index or the glycemic load of individual food items, but the overall glycemic load of the whole meal. Let's suppose we eat our mashed potatoes together with two slices of white bread and a can of Coke. Or let's imagine eating the same mashed potato with just one slice of whole wheat bread with turkey and salad and a can of Diet Coke. What do you think would become of the glycemic load of the whole meal? In the first scenario, we have combined a high glycemic index food, our mashed potatoes, with two other glycemic index foods, white bread and Coke. So we have turned our meal into a glycemic bomb which will make our blood glucose and insulin skyrocket. In the other scenario, we have compensated the high glycemic index of mashed potatoes with a fiber and protein rich, low glycemic index whole wheat bread, green salad and turkey sandwich, and a sugar-free glycemic neutral diet coke, thus lowering the glycemic load of the whole meal. So our pancreas will say thanks. When we'll go over food sources of carbs, I will show you some more glycemic index numerical values. But make no mistake, I'm not suggesting that anybody should calculate the glycemic index and glycemic loads of their meals. We said at the beginning of our course that no one should eat with tables and calculators. Besides, if the concept of glycemic index is impeccable, its numerical quantitation is rather imprecise and variable. It's not just a problem of methodology. Food in itself is highly variable. A carrot grown in Italy can be extremely different from a carrot grown in the US. Different variety, different soil, different products used to grow it, different weather, and so on. And then when it comes to food preparation, such as cookies or bread, we also have different ingredients, different proportions, different processing technologies, different cooking times or temperatures. You already know that all these factors can greatly influence the glycemic index. If we insist on the concept of glycemic index and glycemic load, it's because they are very useful to have an idea of the general metabolic effect of different foods on blood glucose and insulin, but certainly not to make numerical calculations. So to recap, the glycemic index is an indicator that tells us how fast the carbs in a food are digested, absorbed, and raise blood glucose levels. It is determined as the blood glucose response after eating a specific food compared to the response after eating a standard food, glucose, or white bread, providing an equivalent amount of carbohydrates, not an equivalent amount of food. The glycemic index only tells us how fast the carbs in a food raise glycemia, not how much. For that, we must also know how much carb is inside the serving of that food. Combining these two pieces of information, we can determine the glycemic load of our meals. The general rule is that the glycemic load of all of our meals should be as slow as possible. We can accomplish this primarily in two ways. One, by choosing low glycemic index foods, or two, by combining high glycemic index foods with low glycemic index fiber and protein-rich foods to lower the glycemic load of the overall meal.